Hello, massage nerds. I am really excited about continuing all these reviews. My goal is to continue uh, putting out reviews until we hit all 11 systems. I've done the skeletal system review, the muscular system review. Today we're going to be doing the cardiovascular review. So the cardiovascular system, I'm, I'm going to list the anatomy and, and the physiology. Remember the anatomy are the parts and then the physiology is how it all works together. Okay. So uh, most cells are embedded in the tissues and the cells don't, don't move. So the, it's the job of the cardiovascular system, the blood, to bring the nutrients to all those cells throughout your whole body. Cardiology is the study of the cardiovascular system. The anatomy, obviously, is the blood. And remember that blood is connective tissue. So the anatomy remembers the blood, the blood vessels, which is the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries, and the heart, which the heart is a pump. Those are the parts of the cardiovascular system, the anatomy. Now the physiology is how it works. It transports gases, nutrients, hormones, uh, waste, and cell pro cellular products. It, uh, it's also for protection. It protects us because it uh, has the white blood cells which, which builds up our immune system, which is really what fights diseases. All the, you know, we have five types of white blood cells, and I'll go a little bit more into that. And also one of the functions of the, um, the physiology of the cardiovascular system is it combats hemorrhaging. You know, every time you have a cut and you start bleeding, you know, the platelets is what, you know, stops that bleeding. So it's very, very important for clotting, you know, for clotting in your system. So blood is the red fluid circulating throughout your heart, ves throughout your heart vessels. And the color depends on its oxygen content, okay? We all have red blood. There's no such thing as blue blood. The reason that, um, you know, pict pictures of the heart and the, and the blood is pictured in blue and red, I'll explain to you in a minute, has to do, has to do with the oxygen content, okay? The characteristics of blood has to do with, um, you know, it's thick, it's viscous, it's more adhesive than water. It is slightly alkaline. It's not acid. It's slightly alkaline because it needs to keep all the nutrients alive. If it was too acid, it would, you know, kill them. And it's warmer than um, body temperature. So your blood is slightly warmer. It's actually one of the things that keeps us really warm. Approximately 8% of the body weight is blood. We have, about, on an average adult, we have about five, uh, five quarts or 12 pints of blood, you know, circulating throughout our system. And, oh, blood is made up of 55% plasma. Plasma, you know, is 55%, I mean, 90% water. So you can see why it's so important to drink a lot of water, guys. You know, even though I know a lot of you are staying home now, please don't forget to drink lots of water. We should be drinking our body weight, half of that in ounces of water. So let's say I weigh 100 and, you know, 120 pounds. So I need to be drinking 60 ounces of water every day. It's very important for the blood and for all of our other organs. Uh, hematopoiesis is blood formation. And remember from the um, skeletal system that it takes place in the bone, in the red bone marrow, okay? And there's three types of cells. There's the erythrocytes. Erythro, the prefix means red. You know, leuco means white, so leukocytes. Um, <clears throat> there's five types of leukocytes, and uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. And thrombocytes, you know, those are the ones, those are the platelets, aka platelets, that are for blood clotting. Okay, so I talked about plasma being 90% water and 55% of your blood composition. Uh, 
Blood plasma contains glucose, hormones, dissolved proteins, and clotting factors such as fibrinogen. Okay, so there's the, uh, the five types of uh, leukocytes, and they're, you know, I, I don't know that we all need to know the names of them, but I'll give you the names. The neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophil, eus, and lymphocytes, and basophils. And remember the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, are the ones that carry oxygen in, you know, in their hemoglobin. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They lose the nucleus so that it can have more surface area to carry oxygen and so that they can bend. They have to go, the capillaries are so small that sometimes the, the uh, red blood cells have to fold in half to be able, you know, to fit through the capillaries. So red blood cells do not have a nucleus. Their life is approximately three months, 120 days. And then they go to the spleen, you know, to be recycled. So, um, and the white blood cells, they live anywhere from, you know, two weeks to years. Because if your body, if you, let's say you get the, you know, some kind of a flu or some kind of, a, a, you know, sore throat or something, you, you get sick. Your body remembers that, you know, that virus or that bacteria in your body and it has, you know, builds up an immunity to it. That's where vaccines come from. Vaccines give you a small dose of a bacteria, of a virus so that your body can build up the white blood cells so that five years from now, if you're ever exposed to chicken pox or the flu or, you know, it remembers because it's already built up an immunity to it. We have a natural immune system that's wonderful if you stay healthy and drink plenty of water and get plenty of rest. You know, we are born, built with everything we need to survive. So, um, erythrocytes transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. They're also called red blood cells. Hemoglobin binds to oxygen and carbon dioxide so that they can be transported. And it is the most numerous cell are the red blood cells. We have more red blood cells than white and more than, um, than the uh, platelets. So their shape is concave. They're flat in the middle so that... Uh, I got ahead of myself with that one. They're flat in the middle so they can carry more oxygen. Uh, the lifespan is anywhere from 105 to 120 days. Oh, and it has the classification of blood types A, B, or O. You know, uh, A, B are universal recipients, and uh, um, O are universal donors. Okay, so the leukocytes, which is leuco means white, defends the um, pathogens. It's like, a, it's like an army. It's like an army of cells that if they detect any bacteria or anything that's, you know, that shouldn't be in your body, they go against it, you know. So they're called, the white blood cells are the fighters, you know, the ones that go out there and fight any infection that you might have. They remove the dead cells and the, the lifespan is anywhere from a few hours to a few days to years. Uh, thrombocytes reduce blood loss from damaged vessels by promoting, uh, a, you know, hemostasis. So that means they stop the bleeding. You know, if you ever get a cut, you know, the fibrinogen, they're like little, it's like a net that forms right there. It gets sticky so that the red blood cells can get trapped. It's like when you're fishing, you know, when you're fishing, you know, it forms like a little net over a cut. And then all the red blood cells and, you know, the thrombocytes get stuck there and they're jagged. So they form like a little net and then they form the scab, you know. So though that's very important for, uh, for our homeostasis of our body so that we don't bleed to death. And the lifespan of thrombocytes is anywhere from 7 to 10 days. Um, let me continue here. Um, the, oh, I already talked about the universal recipient is the AB, or, you know, the universal donor is the O-type. 
Okay, so let's talk about the heart. This is like one of my favorite things to talk about, the blood circulation of the heart. The heart is like, um, it's like the size of both of your hands put together. If you put your hands together, this is about the size of your heart. And it does lay almost in the middle of your chest. But the apex, which is the um, pointier part, the apex is more towards the left. And then the base, which is the widest part, is a little bit higher. So let's talk about the, the heart is a pump. The heart has to pump to get the blood through your whole system. You know, we're going to talk about the different um, types of uh, systems. Okay, the different uh, like, okay, let me, let me go over the layers. We have three layers in the heart. The epicardium, remember epi is on top. So that's the, the outer layer. The myocardium, remember myo means muscle. So myocardium is the muscle part of the, of the heart, the middle layer. And the endocardium, endo means inside. So that's the inside, you know, um, the lining of the chambers of your blood vessels and your valves. So let's talk about the heart. I, I, I have a picture here and I don't know if you guys can see it. But I'm going to try to explain from here. Let me see if even I can see it. But So, arteries carry blood away from the heart. So, think of arteries with an A means away. Away from the heart. They're carrying oxygenated blood away from the heart. Veins carry back to the heart. And they carry deoxygenated blood. Every time you feel a pulse like your radial artery right here, you feel a pulse, it, you're on an artery. And that's why I tell you when you guys are massaging that if you feel pulse anywhere where you're massaging, you stay off of it because that means you're on an artery. We have the femoral artery, you know, on, on our, on, we can feel it on your foot where they can feel the pulse. And remember, arteries are named by where they travel, just kind of like the veins, like the nerves, you know, where you have the axillary nerve, well, you also have the, you know, the axil axillary, you know, uh, vein. So remember that they are named by where they're traveling, the femoral artery, because it's traveling through the femur, you know, the, uh, the nerve, the femoral nerve, you know, because it's traveling through the femur. So think of that, the arteries, their name, it's, it's the same ones, but they're by, depends on where they're traveling. So arteries take blood away. Arteries for away from the heart, veins bring it back into, veins, I-N, into the heart, okay? So once they get to the heart, and remember we're always talking about anatomical position. So the veins bringing back the deoxygenated blood, that's why this looks blue. When it looks blue, it means that it doesn't have any oxygen, that it's already been delivered to all your cells. So it comes in through the, um, uh, you know, through the uh, superior vena cava, okay? Superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So these are veins, okay? So that's why they're blue. They deliver it to the right atrium. The right atrium opens up, the tricuspid valve opens up and delivers it to the ventricle. And from the ventricle, it pumps it to the lungs. The only exception that we have arteries carry oxygenated blood except for the pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood because they're going away from the heart into the lungs remember arteries carry deoxygenated blood and towards the heart when the when it gets to the heart and there's no more oxygen then it goes to the lungs to drop off the carbon, you know, the carbon dioxide and pick up more oxygen. After it picks up the oxygen, the pulmonary veins, which is the other exception, because remember veins only carry deoxygenated blood, except for the pulmonary veins, because they picked up the oxygen from the lungs. Now they're going to deliver it to the left atrium full of oxygen. And then the left atrium goes through the bicuspid valve and into the uh, left ventricle. 
And then again, it pumps and it goes to the aorta and the aorta has all the, you know, the oxygen and it takes it through your whole system again. So when it's going through your whole system, it's, the, um, it's going through your body and then there's another system where it only goes into your lungs, okay? So I hope I didn't um, confuse you. So I, I know I talk a lot, but oxygenated blood, is carried by the arteries away from the heart. Deoxygenated blood is carried back into the heart, and that's why it's blue, okay? Except for the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins. Those are the only exceptions where it reverses, okay? I hope that didn't, that makes it a little more clear. Vein return, right, vein return. Vein return. Okay, so the tricuspid valve and, uh, and the bicuspid valve is what's in between the atrium and the ventricle. Atrium, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a house that has an atrium that's like the receiving, the receiving chamber where you go into it. I remember I used to have an atrium in a house and it was my receiving chamber. And so the atrium, that's why they call the two heart valve, I mean the two, uh, the first ones are the atriums where you receive the blood and then from there it goes into the ventricles, okay? So the right side of the heart has the tricuspid valve from the atrium to the ventricle and the bicuspid valve, because it only has two little flaps, is on the left side between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And the bicuspid valve also has another name, which is the mitral valve. Why does this one have two names? And the tricuspid only has one? I don't know. If you find out, let me know why. <laughs> because those things really, you know, confuse me. And, you know, it's like, why does one have two names and the other one doesn't? So the, the, the cusp, tricuspid, means three, three little flaps. And bicuspid means two little flaps. Okay, so then let's keep on. Oh, the closure of the valves, when you hear the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve, is the love dub that you hear when you hear a heartbeat. If you have a stethoscope and you, you hear your heartbeat or your, the doctor's listening, that love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, that thump is the closing of the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. That's the sound that it makes. Okay, so the cardiac, cardiac cycle. Let me take a drink of water. My throat's getting dry here. The cardiac cycle is the sequence of events from the beginning of one heartbeat to the next. Like, love dub. That's the cardiac cycle. Love dub. Because, you know, it's going through one heartbeat to the next. The heart rate is the number of cycles in one minute. You know, like, you know how when you're exercising, you count, you know, up to 15, let's say, mine is probably fast because I'm talking, but let's say it's, uh, you know, 15 seconds. Let's count for 15 seconds and uh, uh, see how many you, you, you feel right here at the radial artery. So in 15 seconds, let's say I hear 15, you multiply that times four, you know, that will be, you know, 60. So that will be 60 hearts, 60 beats per minute. And that is the heart rate. Heart rate is how many times your heart beats in a minute. And when you exercise and you're in good shape, your heart rate should be lower. Like athletes have, you know, a heart rate of 40 to 50. Now, if you're, you know, very stressed or, you know, you, you've been running, then your heart rate usually goes up really high. Okay, so let's see. We talked about how the blood flows through the right atrium, left atrium, pulmonary, you know, artery, lungs, pulmonary vein back into the left ventricle. Now it's full of oxygen, and then from the left, from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and then to the aorta. Okay. 
Oh, the uh, AV node is the one that sets the pace. Let me see. The SA node is the one that sets the pace. You know, like people, you've heard of people that get a pacemaker, you know, uh, replaced. Because that's the one that sets, you know, the pace of your heart. Your heart has its own, you know, um, energy. It, it doesn't even depend on the nervous system. It depends on itself, you know, to keep it going, you know, so that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing that, you know, it can beat by itself and that it can set its, you know, um, heartbeat on its own. And that's what, stimu and it stimulates itself to keep on pumping. Because remember that heart is a pump. It has to pump the blood through your whole system. It's a closed, you know, like the, the blood doesn't leave the arteries you know, it, it never leaves. It's all done through diffusion. So, let me see if we saw the heart. Okay, so I, I got ahead of myself again. Uh, so, it's a closed network of tubes. You know, that's that's what they are. It's a closed network of tubes. The blood doesn't leave the veins or the arteries. It stays within. So, we have arteries, veins, and capillaries. The arteries are named by nearby structures. And they're identified as left or right. And um, the arteries are thicker. Think of a, a water hose. When you're watering, you know, like your aorta is almost as thick as a water hose. It has to be thick because it's got to pump blood throughout your whole system from your heart. So it, and it works under pressure. If you guys ever remember, you know, with those squirt guns, you know, that it goes from high concentration to lower concentration. So the, the ventricles contract to push that blood out, you know, and that's when they measure your blood pressure. If your ventricles are not relaxing enough, you know, then you're putting too much pressure on your heart. I think we're going to talk about blood pressure right now. So the walls of the arteries are thicker. The walls of the veins are a little thinner because they're just carrying blood back into the heart. Okay. Oh, vasodilation, and you all know this with massage, you know, vasodilation is when it turns red, you know, and that's what we do friction, you know, on the arm, you know, that there's, or even when you have, you know, let's say you get a sticker and it turns red, you know, there's a lot of blood there. When it turns red, you create vasodilation. That's to, you know, to, it brings heat. It brings more blood flow to that area. To heal itself remember that blood brings nutrients to the you know to the muscles to all of your organs so what it does is it brings the oxygen and the nutrients you know back into your cells that you need so that's how we get fed is through our you know through our blood which is very important hyperemia or vasoconstriction it becomes smaller you know like with ice when you put ice on your body, it turns your skin white because it's pushing the, the blood away from the surface of the body. Hyperemia is uh, increased local blood flow. The skin may redden and feel warm. Ischemia is decreased blood flow. Skin may become pale and feel cool. And we see a lot of ischemia in our practice. You know, so I think when you get sensitive enough to notice body tissue, let's say you're working on somebody's back and you see where it's kind of pale, you know, maybe by the rhomboids, then you know that it's ischemic, that it, the, 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 the fascia is, is squeezing maybe the muscle so tight, it's not letting the blood flow freely through there. So that's our job to create, you know, vasodilation and bring blood flow to that area so it can start relaxing and releasing. And I always tell my students that really all we do is assist the body to heal itself. That's really all we do. We don't, you know, we're not miracle workers. Intent is very important, but we're really just assisting the body to heal itself because we're control, you know, we're helping the body, you know, get the blood flow again. Oh, somebody just said hi. <laughs> So I know we work a lot with ischemia. So when you're working on a body and you see that it's kind of pale, that means that they don't have a lot of blood flow to that area. So you can increase it by manipulating the tissue around it. 
and also by you know cupping wash off there's lots of techniques friction to potament all of those you know so vessels transporting blood away from the heart are the are you know the arteries blood and uh, arteries and blood. okay i already said all this sorry i always get ahead of myself pulse is where you know where you feel your pulse that's from the arteries arterioles arterioles are smaller thinner you know uh Art, arteries. So you have arteries, arteoles, veins, venules, and then um, capillaries. Capillaries are the smaller ones. It's in the capillary beds where gas exchanges. It's in the capillary beds where you exchange the oxygen for the carbon, you know, um, dioxide. Oh, okay. So now we're talking about the blood pressure. Systole, systole, or systole, depending. Some people pronounce it systole, some uh, systole. Are when the ventricles contract and eject blood. So it's the pressure in the arteries increase. So systole is the top number. So it's, that would be like your 120 over 80. That's perfect blood pressure, 120 over 80. So diastole is the when the ventricles relax, okay? And they fill up with blood. So that's when... They're empty after they've pushed out the blood, the ventricles. The ventricles are also stronger, just kind of like the arteries. They're thicker. The atriums are a little thinner because they don't have to push blood very far. It's just to the chamber below. So they receive the blood and, you know, they're going from on top. The ventricles are on top of the heart and then the valves open and they just deliver it to the bottom part, which would be the ventricles. Okay, so they don't have to go very far. They don't have to, you know, be as thick. Now the ventricles have to squeeze harder to push the blood, you know, through your whole system. The, the left ventricle has to really squeeze hard. And when those don't relax enough after, you know, um, they've pumped the blood, that's where high blood pressure comes from. That's the more dangerous number is the, the diastolic number is the more dangerous number, the bottom one. So that's the way they tell you, you know, if you're up to 90, 120 over 90, that's, you know, already borderline, you know, high hypertension because you're trying to keep it at 120 over 80 because that means your heart is working too hard to, you know, to pump out the blood. And that's where you get high blood pressure. And that's why exercise is so important, guys. You really have to, you know, um, to exercise. So the sphygmomanometer, sphygmomanometer is like, <laughs> that's a mouthful. If you guys can say, I tell my students, if you guys can say this in class, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you 10 points. Sphygmomanometer is nothing more than the, than the stethoscope. So that's a fancy name for the stethoscope. Blood, normal blood, blood pressure is 120 over 80. High blood pressure, hypertension is considered 140 over 90. So the capillaries is where gas and nutrients exchange. They're thin, very permeable, you know, walls. They move blood from within the capillaries and slow, intermittent uh, microcirculation is the blood flow in the capillary beds. Remember I was telling you by diffusion, they deliver oxygen and then they pick up carbon dioxide in the capillary beds. And that's where the red blood cells sometimes have to fold, you know, that's why they're biconcave, so that they can fold to pass through the capillaries because the capillaries are so small. That's why they don't have a nucleus, you know, so that they can bend because the capillaries are really, really, really small. Uh, veins return uh, blood to the heart. Veins with an IN, they bring it back into the heart. And they bring deoxygenated, oxygen depleted um, blood, except for the pulmonary veins. Remember, that's there's two exceptions: pulmonary veins carry um, oxygenated blood, and walls are thinner. We talked about that. Uh, the venules are smaller and branch out. Uh, oh, most blood is is carried in the veins. 
So, you know, Venus return, you know, it, it returns back into your heart. That's why walking is so, exercise is so important because the skeletal muscles help pump the blood, okay? They help pump the blood throughout your body too. Like people, I don't know if all of you have ever traveled, you know, been on a flight for a long time or in a car and your ankles get kind of swollen, you know, because, it, you know, the kind of, it starts pulling the, oh, I don't want to get into the lymphatic system, but anyway, it has to do with the lymphatic system too. But So you've got to, you know, get up and move. Walking is very good for the circulatory system. And veins, this is something that's very important for us as therapists. Veins have little valves that prevent backflow, okay? That's why you always give a massage, you know, centripetal towards the heart, not centrifugal. Centrifugal is away from the heart. So if the veins return blood back into the heart, you know, and the little valves close after the blood passes, so it doesn't pull back, you know, on your foot or stay on your ankle or stay, you know, if you, uh, you know, if we didn't have those little veins right here that have the valves, then the blood would stay by our hands. So as soon as the blood passes through the veins, the little valves close so that they, to prevent backflow. And when you're putting pressure against those little valves, that's what gives people varicose veins. People that stand for too long, they're constantly putting pressure against the, the little valves that keep the blood from flowing back. That's what forms, um, um, what am I thinking about? Hello, I just had a brain fart. Um, it'll come to me right now. <laughs> Anyway, well, varicose veins, I just said it, varicose veins. It'll cause varicose veins if you put pressure against those valves. It's nothing more than damage to the valves in the veins that cause um, the, what I just said. Wow, why am I having a brain fart? I think my brain is already varicose veins. Anyway, so that's the reason it's important for you to work towards the heart on the limbs. You know, you always want to work towards the heart when you're putting pressure. You can do nerve ending strokes, you can do a little bit of petrosage, that's fine. I don't want to scare you guys because I know some of you are going to get scared. Don't get scared. Just when you're putting pressure, like if you're going with your forearm, you know, on the leg or the arm, make sure it's always towards the heart. You don't want to put pressure against those small little valves, especially with clients that come in regular because I've had clients that I've had for 20 years. You know, they, they come in, well, they did up until three weeks ago. They would come in regular once a week, once every two weeks. Can you imagine if I put pressure against those valves for 20 years? Eventually, it damages those valves. So you've got to be very careful when you're working on your clients, you know, to make sure that, you know, that you work towards the heart on the appendicular skeleton. Okay. I talked about the skeletal being the muscle pump that squeeze and, rele and release. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. <laughs> when then I go through the parts. Oh, I already said that. Okay. So, okay. So we have the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. The pulmonary circuit is, you know, it replenishes blood and back into the into the lungs. So that's why it's called pulmonary. Remember, pulmonary means lungs. So the pulmonary circuit is within the lungs. The systemic circuit is throughout the whole body. It transports oxygen to the whole body. Okay, I think, and also the hepatic system, you know, the liver and the stomach also has its own little system. And I think that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it. We covered everything. So one of the things that, you know, I want you to take from the cardiovascular system is how important it is for us as therapists, how much we affect this, especially for people that are laying down all the time, that, that are, you know, bedridden. You know, it's very important for us to continue working on them because that really helps the blood flow. It prevents blood clots, you know, one of the symptoms of blood clots that we have to be careful with is you always feel to see if it's hot. If you see a red patch on a leg, you know, and it's 
warm to the touch and it's if it's very painful then you need to refer them you know to a doctor because it could be a blood clot and blood clots don't look like little balls it's not like it's a little ball it looks like a long like the the way the veins are you know it's shaped long you know so it could be a blood clot and we do have to be careful with that you know we have to be careful with people that have diabetes because their circulation is a lot slower so we do have to slow down the massage a little bit you know for people that have you know diabetes we also if we have somebody with high blood pressure you know we want to slow it down a little bit but if we have somebody that's going to go to run in a marathon and they want a massage you know pre-event then we speed it up a little bit more so we really do have a big effect on the cardiovascular system when we work on somebody so keep that in mind don't be intimidated and don't be afraid. I know all of you will be doing, you know, a fantastic job when we get back to work and finally get to work on our clients again. So I hope this uh, cardiovascular system review helped you. It's different when I don't have people asking questions and talking to anybody in real life. But hopefully this helped you and I will let you know when I do the next one. Until the next time, guys, create a wonderful day.